Thanks a ton, Caitlin. I'll take the wireless mic. I really appreciate being here today. It's such a great group of people. And it's particularly inspiring me for me to come to places like North Carolina to see that the vegan movement and the animal rights movement are growing in the heart of darkness. Because North Carolina is one of the biggest animal abusing states in the entire country. And in fact, one of the largest slaughterhouses in the world is just a few hours away from here in Tar Heel, North Carolina. And we need you. We need you so much. Because in, this, in these areas of the country, these areas of the country, there are so few people speaking for animals that every single voice becomes even more important. But today I'm going to talk about three things. Um, one is kind of the problem that we face today as animal advocates, and in particular, the fact that the rules of the system when it comes to animals, the rules are so corrupt, so unfair, so disgusting that animals are treated like less than nothing. The second, I'm going to talk about how you change the rules. When the rules of the game are rigged, when they're so corrupt and rotten that there's nothing that we can do within the system to bring even a moment of respite to these victims of violence, the only way to change those rules sometimes is to break them. Third, I'm going to talk about what you can do to help us create a movement of righteous rule breakers to change the world for animals. So the first point, the rules of the game. So a lot of times as animal activists, we think what we have to do is change every individual on the street. That you know, we walk by somebody who's eating a hot dog or a steak, and we think, how do I convince them? How do I convince this one person to stop eating animals? And this is a very important question. It's a question we thought about for a long time. But I want to suggest that there's a deeper and more profound problem we face as animal advocates. And that is that the rules around us, the rules that shape our behavior, that shape our culture, that shape even the way we think and feel, are corrupt and rotten to the core. I'll give you some examples. I'm going to apologize ahead of time. Some of these are sad examples. But you hear a lot of really horrifying stories as a lawyer and animal advocate. And one of the cases that came up recently that shocked and horrified me more than any other was a case involving a police shooting of two dogs. So in Michigan, some police officers had a search warrant to enter someone's home for a nonviolent offense, for a drug offense. They knock on the door. No one's there. They bust the door open. And there's two little pit bulls, one about 60 pounds, one about 30 pounds, barking at them. So the cops look at the dogs, they look around at the house, and they decide these dogs are making too much noise. These dogs are barking at us. They could be aggressive. We don't know what to make of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to shoot them. They shoot one of the dogs, and the dog runs away in terror. The smaller dog, the 30-pound dog, follows this dog into the basement. And now these two dogs are just cowering in the basement. One of the dogs is bleeding to death slowly. She's whining in pain. And the officers still decide, well, we're trying to search this house and find the drugs. We can't have these two live animals downstairs potentially making noise or announcing that we're here. So they go down to the basement. And again, the dog that's been shot starts to bark. She barks. She howls. She does what, frankly, most good dogs do when strangers enter the house. She tries to notify her family and her guardian. And from the, even the police's account, this dog was not even turned towards the police. She was cowering, open to her side. And all of us who know dogs, when a dog is shifting to her side and her head is down, that's not an aggressive posture. That's a posture of terror. When they're showing their back and their side, they're not trying to hurt you. They're trying to get away. But the police officers decide, this dog is making too much noise. And so they shoot her again and kill her. The other dog runs even further away into a corner of the basement. She doesn't even make a peep. She's just sitting in the corner of the basement, cowering in fear, but the cops decide to shoot her as well. So these officers, not only were not punished, not only were not held accountable, were not even given a slap on the wrist. And the reason is that this happens to thousands and thousands of dogs every year when police officers execute search warrants. The animals of this earth, including the dogs and cats we love most, who are our own family members, are considered so valueless that they can be thrown aside like a chair. Frankly, even if you destroyed a chair, the police officers would be accountable for at least the value of the chair. But shooting a dog is nothing when the police officer has a search warrant and is allowed to enter your home. The rules of the game are written against us and against the animals. Here's example two. A few decades ago, there was a baby elephant in Mozambique. And like most baby elephants, she loved her family dearly. So elephants have generational families 
that sometimes have a history and tradition that lasts hundreds of years of, of culture, of traditions, of learning, where to get food and water. And this baby elephant was cherished by her family. Her name was Tyke. But one day, a bunch of people came down on Tyke's family. They shot her mother, her father. They decimated all the adults in the family, took their ivory away, and decided to hold all the babies captive. So they shipped him off to America, and Tyke, from that day on, for the rest of her life, was a slave. And for 20 years, she was beaten with bullhucks, she was shocked with prods, and trained to perform ridiculous stunts and tricks to perform in a human circus. For 20 years, Tyke endured this indignity. For 20 years, Tyke endured the beatings, the bullhooks. If you know anything about bullhooks, they hit these animals with sharp knives. Hook is not even the right word for it. It's a blade. They hit these animals with blades and the most sensitive parts of their bodies to induce them to perform humiliating tricks because elephants do not want to jump through hoops. They do not want to stand on top of each other. They're forced to do this by violence. They did this every day of Tyke's life for 20 years, and after 20 years, Tyke had enough, so she tried to get away. Has anyone heard the story of what happened to her in Honolulu? What happened? She escaped, and she was killed. So for seeking out her freedom, for doing the thing that, frankly, every sentient being on this planet would do if you were trapped in a cage, being beaten every day of your life by people who did not care about you even one bit. She was attacked, she was yelled at, and she was shot 87 times. She bled to death on the streets of Honolulu. And this was her fate. She was killed for the crime of wanting to be free. And again, no repercussions for the police, no repercussions for the circus, no repercussions or accountability at all for the people who murdered her family in Africa and kidnapped her and enslaved her in the United States. These are the rules of the system. The rules of the system are rigged. The rules need to change. A last example that comes from the animals who are exploited more than any other set of animals in our society, animals and farms. And the scholar Timothy Potrat, a political scientist at the University of Massachusetts, writes about an experience he had when he was doing field work in a slaughterhouse. So occasionally in the slaughterhouses, the animals escape from the pens. And on one day in Omaha, Nebraska, in the largest cattle slaughterhouse in the world, where they kill over 5,000 heads of cattle every single day, every 12 seconds another cow goes through the slaughterhouse. One of these baby cows, and these are babies when they're killed. They're just one year old. Cows have a natural lifespan of 20 years old. They're killed about one. So it's equivalent to about a five-year-old human being. One of these baby cows, desperate with fear, rushed out of the pen. And occasionally this does happen. And sometimes there are happy stories, and these animals make it to sanctuary. But on this day, a cream-colored cow, a cream-colored calf, did not make it to a sanctuary. She ran straight into a wire fence across the street from the slaughterhouse. She didn't know what to do. She had been in a CAFO or in a feedlot almost her entire life. She had been crammed in a slaughter transport truck for up to 20 hours of no food and water. She was desperate for water. She was desperate for food. She was desperate for safety. So she did what all terrified animals did. She just cowered. And because the slaughterhouse workers could not get her back into the pen, could not get her into a truck, they called the police. The police approached the cow. They tried to cajole her. They called animal control. They used shock prods to try and shock her back in the slaughterhouse. But this little cream-colored calf refused to go back to the slaughterhouse because she did not want to suffer and die. And so what they did was what we do to all animals who are living in fear and not doing what they're told. They shot her. They shot her once, and she bellowed out in pain. They shot her again. She fell to the ground. This is a shotgun, not just a pistol. A shotgun that was tearing through her flesh, tearing through her face. They shot her again and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, and again, 10 times. They shot her in the face with a shotgun before finally she stopped bellowing in pain. And even the slaughterhouse workers, the workers who themselves are using knives to kill 5,000 cows every day, were shocked and stunned and horrified by the scene of violence that they had just witnessed. And Timothy Patrat writes about this, how at lunch that day, the slaughterhouse workers were all shaking their heads and saying, they shot her. They shot her. They shot her. They shot her for no reason. 
So these are examples of how the system is rigged against the animals and rigged against us as compassionate people who are trying to change that system. That even in these grotesque, horrifying, sickening instances of abject animal cruelty, not only is there no accountability, there is not even a slap on the wrist. Most of these instances, if not for scholars like Timothy Patrat and activists like the few activists in Michigan who advocated on behalf of the family whose dogs were shot by the police, no one would have heard any of these stories because it never makes the news. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. We start imagining all the other violence against animals that happens behind closed doors and in lands very distant from the urban areas in which we live. The suffering and atrocities that have been committed are unimaginable. There are over 50 billion animals killed in fashions exactly like those dogs, that elephant, and that baby cow, in factory farms, and slaughterhouses and laboratories. And there are trillions of individual animals who are suffering and dying because of environmental devastation we are causing to this planet. We are poisoning the environments in which animals live. We're clear-cutting their homes, burning down their homes, and letting their in children starve. And climate change, climate change is terraforming this entire planet. It's transforming this entire planet into a barren wasteland where the non-human animals will starve to death and die first. In fact, scientists estimate that already 1.5 million species, 1.5 million species have already been committed to extinction just due to climate change. That is trillions of individual animals suffering and dying in ways that we cannot even fathom. And again, no one is doing a thing about it. Even the United Nations, which has been a strong advocate for action against climate change. In their most recent report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, when they were announcing the plausible and anticipated negative impacts of climate change and arguing for investments in stopping climate change, guess how many dollars they suggested global governments invest in protecting non-human life from the havoc that's being by caused by climate change? How many dollars? Just zero. Zero dollars. For all those trillions of individuals, all those hundreds of thousands of species, they'll be decimated and exterminated from this planet for perpetuity, permanently, for the rest of the world. They suggest that we invest zero dollars. And they argued that the impacts on animals are too small or uncertain for us to justify any monetary investment in protecting animals. So you look at facts like these, and you look at stories like these, and you have to, to understand that when individuals eat animals, or when individuals decide there's nothing I can do about it other than maybe buy humane meat, it isn't because they individually have decided, I like a world where millions of species are going extinct, when polar bear mothers are drowning in the Arctic and their children are starving to death, where the entire planet is being terraformed into a barren wasteland, where cows are being shot to death in the face over and over again for the crime of wanting to be free. No one chooses this system. This system happens because the rules of the game have been written by powerful institutions, by corporations, and by, frankly, corrupt traditions that have dominated the other life on this planet and dominate us, too, for thousands and thousands of years. When we first put, when we first put the chain around an animal's neck 10,000 years ago, we did it not because anyone anticipated the consequences over the next 10,000 years of the domestication of animals. We did this unthinkingly because we needed to survive. But the world we live in is very different today. Survival for life on this planet depends not on us putting a chain on the necks of animals or human beings, but on us liberating all of us on this planet, human and non-human. Life on this planet will only exist, will only thrive, will only continue if we see the importance of liberation not captivity. So we have these rules, these disgusting, corrupt rules that are leading to violence, captivity, enslavement across the entire world against human and non-human animals because Smithfield doesn't just torture and kill pigs. Surprisingly, Smithfield has been caught torturing and enslaving human beings from Asia, which is a totally different story. If you don't believe me, Google Smithfield slavery. And you'll find out about it. When the rules of the game being written by powerful corporations, being written by corrupt traditions, and corrupt governments are so rigged against us, what do we do? Well, we look to history, and we see what brave, 
smart and passionate activists throughout history have done when the rules are rigged against the victimized population. And what they've decided, what they've found over and over again, is when the rules are corrupt, when they're rotten to the core, sometimes the only way you can change those rules is by breaking them. So the action that Caitlin talked about just a few moments ago was an illustration and demonstration of direct action, of the importance of understanding the power that we have as individuals, and even more collectively, in changing the world if we have the courage, the training, and the passion, and the commitment to break unjust laws. Gandhi, over 100 years ago, decided that the rules of British imperialism were unjust. And for decades, people tried to reform these rules, had tried to work within the system, had begged the emperors and the prime ministers and the bureaucrats of the United Kingdom, which was an empire, was a kingdom back then, to please give the people of India even some basic rights, even the right to sell salt, to make money for my food, my family, to survive. And for decades, the Indian government had ignored them. And so one day, in the early 20th century, Gandhi said, enough is enough. We need to start organizing to disobey these rules. We need to understand that if we actually believe in our heart of hearts that these rules are unjust, that they're corrupt, then it is our moral duty to break them, to disobey them. He began to understand that sometimes the only way to change the wor world is to disobey the rules, to not do what we're taught and not do what we're told. And so he gathered, at first, just a few dozen activists to march to the beaches of India and gather salt for themselves, which at the time was forbidden. An Indian person, a white person was allowed to do this, but an Indian person cannot do something as simple as gather salt for themselves and sell that salt to feed their own family. In a country with abject poverty, millions of people and children literally starving to death, Indian people were not allowed to gather salt to pay the bills for their own family. And we can see in hindsight, this is preposterous, just as animal cruelty is preposterous. It's indefensible. But in that system, in that day, the rules of the game said, as an Indian person, you're not allowed to bend over and pick up some salt from the beach. And Gandhi said, enough is enough. This is an unjust law. It is a broken system. And the only way for us to illustrate this, to start a national, an international conversation about whether it is a just law, is to start breaking it. And so they marched. And at first, they only had a few dozen people. And Gandhi in his robes and garments, everyone thought, oh, who's this fringe activist? He's practically naked, marching 100 miles to the salt beaches. But something interesting happened. More and more people heard this story, this story of people marching to break the rules, of people marching for a world that was free and safe for every person in India, not just the English, but the people of color as well. And more people started gathering. And suddenly, there were huge crowds in every city on this march, the salt march, to the beach. There were thousands of people gathering around because it turned out there were so many people who for decades were sick of begging, were sick of negotiating, were sick of pretending that the world was a just and safe place for them and were ready to take direct action. And when they got to the beach, they had thousands of people who gathered with Gandhi to take that salt out of the sand. And they sold that salt. They made money for their families. And they fed their families justly and freely for the first time in over 100 years. And something happened after that, too. Because not only did those thousands of people gather on the beaches of India, but millions of people across the entire world heard that story. Because when you break the laws... When you take that sacrifice, and many of these activists did go to prison for this simple act of nonviolent civil disobedience. When you break those laws and dramatize the story by sacrificing your own freedom and your own life, your own body for this cause, then people start to pay attention. This same story has been told so many times over the past hundred years now. And it's why Bill McKibben, the famous environmental activist, calls nonviolent direct action, nonviolent civil resistance, the most powerful tool for activists in the 20th century. But there's one movement that has not used it pretty much at all, and that is the movement for animals. So I want to tell you a story about an instance of us starting to use it in the city of San Francisco. So for the past few years, DXC has been mobilizing activists across the country and across the world in a form of activism called Open Rescue. In Open Rescue, we don't hide our identities. We don't pretend we're someone who we're not. We go in with no masks on, telling the media and the world exactly who we are under cover of night. 
We rescue the animals, document the cruelties inside these horribly abusive facilities, and then we share the stories of these rescued animals to the world. We've been in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Last year, I came to Asheville Vegan Fest, and a couple weeks after I was in Vegan Fest, we ran ABC National News for a rescue that happened in Yuling, China. But you've yet to do something in daylight until just last week. And the power of doing these sorts of actions, of walking right into a slaughterhouse and taking the animals out in defiance of the law, is the power of civil disobedience, of proudly bearing the sacrifice, and illustrating and demonstrating and provoking a system that we believe is profoundly unjust. And if we think the system is unjust, then let's try and create a world that is just by living in a way and acting in a way as if the rules have already changed. So that's what we did. For months, we trained activists. We meditated together. We talked to each other. We cried with each other. We went inside of this slaughterhouse with undercover cameras, documenting the abuses that happened inside. And just as in every slaughterhouse, and this slaughterhouse is no worse than any other slaughterhouse I've been in, there were animals rotting to death. Animals cramped in cages. Birds cramped so tightly they couldn't spread their wings. And many of you may know this already, but under federal animal cruelty law, birds are not even considered animals. The USDA has failed second grade biology in failing to protect birds under the Humane Slaughter Act and the 28-hour law. So while mammals, supposedly, every 28 hours, need to stop in a transport truck and be given food and water, birds, because they're denied even the basic dignity of being considered a sentient being, of being considered an animal, they can be transported for 100 hours, 200 hours, 1,000 hours of no food and water. They can starve to death and dehydrate to death with no accountability within the legal system. So these birds, like so many birds, transported hundreds or thousands of miles to a slaughterhouse were languishing. They didn't have any food and water. Many of them were already collapsed on the ground and dead. Many of these birds were literally eating each other alive because they were so desperate for food and water. We documented these cruelties. And for the past year or so, we've been going to the city government of San Francisco and Berkeley and Oakland, to the state Department of Food and Agriculture, saying we are documenting over and over again grotesque, hideous cruelties that ordinary people are outraged by and want to stop, vegan or non-vegan. And the government, as it always does when the rules are rigged, when the rules are corrupt, has been ignoring us. So what did we do? We decided we needed to take direct action. So we gathered these hundreds of activists. We trained them. We went to a conference called the DAC Forum. We had an all-day training on rescue. We had an all-day training on nonviolence. We had meditations. We gathered together, prayed together, cried together over the hideous things that happened to animals, and then we decided we're going to take action. For the first time in US history, hundreds of us are going to march into a slaughterhouse in broad daylight and take every single one of those animals out who we can take out. And that's exactly what we did. Over 200 activists with white flowers on our hands marched quietly and peacefully to the slaughterhouse. A few dozen of us marched into the slaughterhouse. And every single day in the slaughterhouse, there are over 400 animals who die all sorts of birds, and sometimes even mammals. We saw the crowded conditions, and we walked right to the back to the slaughter farm. And the way chickens are slaughtered, especially in these small-scale slaughterhouses, is grotesque beyond imagination. They have this centrifuge. So the first thing they do is they slit the animal's throat. But the animal is not unconscious after the throat has been slit. The animal sometimes dies by being thrown into a centrifuge that is meant to spin and spin and spin and take all their feathers off. And so routinely, these animals will be thrown into a centrifuge that's spinning at 300 miles an hour. And it almost looks like some sort of alien torture device because there's all these tendrils and tentacles that come out of the centrifuge. I wish I could show you a picture of this. So we walked to the back where this man was throwing dead birds into the centrifuge. We walked in with white flowers, and we said to him, Sir, look around you. Look at the feces covering these cages. These birds are living in crates piled on top of each other with literally feces raining down on their heads. Look at the blood flowing to the drains underneath you. Listen to the cries of the birds behind us. You can hear them screaming. And when these birds scream, especially baby chickens, and these are all babies because they're killed at just six weeks, listen to these hundreds of baby birds screaming. It sounds like human children. Sir, this is horrific. This is violence. And please, sir, it has to stop today. We need to release all the animals. And an amazing thing happened when we talked to the slaughterhouse worker with flowers in our hands and compassion in our hearts. Even the slaughterhouse worker, who was holding a dead chicken in our hands, stunned by the interaction, 
stunned by our message, stunned by our message of compassion, said, I understand what you're saying. I think cruelty is wrong too. So imagine that. Envision that. A world where even the slaughterhouse workers, even the person who's literally responsible for sending every single one of those animals to death, when actually confronted compassionately with the cruelty of the system, right where the cruelty is happening, said to us, I understand and I agree. Chickens should not suffer. So the, the workers at the slaughterhouse did eventually call the police because we started taking the animals out and they weren't sure what to do. And when the police arrived, something even more fascinating happened. The first two cops who walked in, and the average San Francisco beat cop, they've never been inside of a slaughterhouse. They've never seen the blood and the feces or heard the screams of the animals. These two cops walk in. They see a throng of us standing inside with white flowers, taking the hens out. They look to the right, they look to the left, they sniff a little, they've got this look of horror in their faces, and they walk right back out of the slaughterhouse because they were scared and horrified by what they were saying. They did not want to be there. They did not understand the situation. They were confused and scared and horrified, and they left the slaughterhouse. So the people who the slaughterhouse had called to kick us out were afraid to come in because it was so graphic and disgusting inside. So they called in backup, and eventually there was a throng of 12 police officers, including a supervisor and sergeant. The supervisor is the only one who's willing to walk, and the others stay in a throng outside, immediately outside the slaughterhouse, in the foyer that leads into the back where the hens and other birds are being held captive. The supervisor comes in and says to all of us with white flowers on our hands who are sitting in the slaughterhouse, refusing to leave, bearing witness, and taking the hens out one by one, sir, you have to leave. This is their property, and you have to leave. And we say to the supervisor the same thing we say to the worker. Look around you. So often as advocates, when we're fighting the fight for animal rights, we're fighting over a product that has been manipulated and contorted and twisted and transformed into something that looks tasty, something that looks appetizing, that looks normal. But when you're inside of a slaughterhouse and there are literally birds being eaten alive and rotting to death just a few feet away, all of those illusions dissipate. And even this sergeant is forced to confront the reality of animal exploitation inside of a slaughterhouse. So the cop looks around to his right and his left, and he sees these birds who are languishing. Some birds are missing eyes. Some of them have infections on their heads, on their bodies, the size of golf balls. Pus is coming out of these infections because they've been living in these sickening conditions, sometimes for days, without any sort of treatment or even fresh air. And the cop says, there's nothing I can do about this, but you need to leave. So we point to one individual bird, and we name this bird Hope eventually. And we say, look at this bird. And this is one of the birds who is horribly mutilated because when you're crammed into a crate, and you drive in a truck with no food and water for sometimes two or three days, animals, including human beings, will start to go after each other. And this bird had an eye that was utterly decimated. There was blood flowing from it. There was pus, white pus seeping out of the inflammation around her eye. And we pointed this one individual bird. And we said to the sergeant, sir, but just look at this one individual bird. How can we justify this? How can we justify this little beautiful bird, this baby bird, literally piece by piece, being torn to pieces alive. And the officer just shook his head. So I approached the crate, and I took the bird out. And I brought the bird right up to the officer's face. And you're going to see video footage of this soon. It's dramatic and amazing video footage. And I bring this bird right up to the officer, as far away as you and I are, are, far, are apart right now. And I show him up close the bird. And he looks at the bird. He looks at me. And I say to him again, sir, we're taking this bird out. We're taking this bird out. She's suffering and she deserves to be free. And the officer says, okay. So the protest, the, the workers around this officer have been complaining this entire time. The owner of the slaughterhouse has already called the police probably a dozen times saying, these activists are in my slaughterhouse, they're stealing my property. And the man they've called, the man they've designated to enforce the law cannot find, the cur cannot find it in himself to subject this animal to cruelty, to send this animal who's been suffering her entire life to her death. So the officer afterwards said, it just wasn't my call to make. And the funny thing is, it was his call to make. In fact, it was only his call to make. He was the man designated by the San Francisco police, by the city of San Francisco, by the state of California, and by the U.S. government to enforce the law, to enforce the rules of the game, to ensure that animals remain trapped in cages and tortured and mutilated and killed. And even the man who was tasked and designated with enforcing that rule, that corrupt 
rigged, disgusting rule that treats animals as if they're worse than things, less than things, could not enforce that rule when he's confronted with an individual animal in pain. So he let us take that bird out. He let us steal the bird. And he said, you guys need to go now. And frankly, the only reason he arrested me, and I was arrested, was because I refused to leave until all the birds were free. We did that. So we did that, actually. So this, this is a powerful illustration of nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience, of people taking radical confrontational action, breaking the rules with love in their hearts to assist animals in need. And it shows how the rules change. We could literally feel and see and hear the wheels turning in this officer's head because he had to explain to himself, to his family, to his community, to his kids, what I did today at work. And he did not want to have to tell his kids, I sent a poor baby bird to her death. So what he was able to say to his kids instead was, today, I did something brave. Even as a police officer, as a person who is tasked with enforcing a slaughterhouse's property rights, I let some activists steal that bird, take that bird to sanctuary. But this is a powerful demonstration of how nonviolent direct action and civil disobedience work to transform the system. Because while we changed the rules in one slaughterhouse on that day, in the heart and the mind of one set of police officers, because it wasn't just one sergeant. There was a throng of police officers outside who almost parted the waters like Moses coming out of Egypt for this activist, my friend Hannah, carrying this bird out of the slaughterhouse. Because they all just parted the waters and let her walk out. There were a dozen police officers who allowed this act of theft, of burglary, of stealing to happen. We created a new set of rules in that microcosm. It's almost like the universe was transformed within that slaughterhouse because we decided to break the rules in a nonviolent and loving way. But imagine, imagine, instead of just having 200 activists, imagine having 20,000 activists. Imagine every person at this festival walking and driving over to that slaughterhouse in Tar Heel, North Carolina, where they send 30,000 pigs, beautiful baby pigs, no different than our dogs and cats, into hell every single day. Imagine all of us walking in with white flowers, sitting down in front of the blades and the bolt guns, stopping these workers from continuing to subject these animals to violence, and saying, and not just saying, but demanding that we stop the violence now. The power of mass civil disobedience is that the system cannot justify itself. When the system is forced to justify itself, it collapses. And when animals are being torn to pieces alive, as happens to millions of animals on the slaughterhouse lines every year. When animals are confined in transport trucks so tightly that they're literally trampling each other to death. When the law of the land says that people who protect these animals are criminals and the corporations who torture these animals are supported with billions of dollars in subsidies. When the system is so convoluted and corrupt and absurd and immoral, profoundly immoral, it cannot justify itself. It cannot survive a righteous confrontation. And if we confront the system by breaking those rules and subject ourselves and our movement to not just the court of public opinion, but the court of law, the system will collapse on itself. So this brings me to my third point. If you believe in the power of civil resistance, whether it's Gandhi marching to the beaches and gathering salt for his people, Martin Luther King Jr. marching in Birmingham in defiance of the law and bringing civil rights to this country, or more recently, environmental activists at Keystone or at the Dakota Access Pipeline blocking corporations from destroying our planet, taking oil out of the ground and polluting our air and killing off future generations. If you believe in the power of civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action for human and non-human animals, what can you do? First thing I'm going to suggest is train and learn and educate yourself. Because in all these historical movements, whether it was Gandhi, King, or most recently, the, the movement for direct action and environmentalism. There have been training camps that have erupted across the country. In the civil rights movement, every single activist who went to a nonviolent direct action was expected to go through an all-day training. They learned about the philosophy and strategy of nonviolence. They learned about the importance of breaking unjust laws, about the duty that we all have to break unjust laws. And they understood the power of their sacrifice. They understood that they went to jail when they were beaten by police officers, when they were attacked by police dogs, when they were even killed, as Gandhi and King were both killed, that sacrifice could change the world. And that was why they were brave enough to do what they did. In the Animal Rights Act, 
In the animal rights movement, we don't have the same communities that the black church have or the Indian independence movement have. We have to create our own communities. We have to come together and share with each other, learn from each other, start having workshops and trainings, learn each other's names, learn each other's biographies, learn each other's backgrounds. So when push comes to shove and someone is standing beside me, risking their life with me, I know I can trust them with my freedom and my life. So DXC, we believe fiercely in the power of community, in the power of community, and the power of education. So we have conferences like the DXC Forum where people come and learn from professional, professional trainers in civil disobedience and nonviolent direct action, like Kazu Haga of the East Point Peace Academy. We have people learning from activists who have done dozens of open rescues like myself, so they understand how to care for an animal, how to get an animal out of an abusive situation in a way that's safe, and they'll lead to the best outcome for that animal and the activist who's bringing her out. We need to do more of this. So one, train, educate, and empower yourself. Find people, believe the same things you believe, and share with each other best practices and knowledge. The second thing you need to do is support the movement in all the ways that you can. So every time in the civil rights movement they went out and did a powerful nonviolent direct action, there would be a few months of fundraising, of preparations, of trying to find lawyers, trying to find media spokespeople, finding writers, finding clergy and religious institutions who would support the campaign. And get to the point where we have mass civil disobedience, where thousands of people are marching into slaughterhouses for animal rights. We need to do the same. We need to support the movement. So not every activist is in a place where they can be on the front lines. Some of us have families, sick relatives, children, human and non-human children. Some of us might be undocumented. So the risks of taking nonviolent direct action and being on the front lines are much greater than for a citizen of the United States. But all of us can provide a support role can provide the lifeblood for the movement, because that's what community is. That's what training is. It's a fertile ground on which a movement can grow. So whether it's donating to the cause, offering up your services, or even sharing a protest that you've seen on Facebook, all this is instrumental to building the power for this movement. Because every single small action of support that you engage in is going to encourage someone else to be bolder, to be braver and stronger for the animals and for this earth. The third thing I'm going to suggest that we can all do is find the power and strength in ourselves. Because there is extensive sociological research showing that when these movements grow, while there are figureheads that we remember, like Gandhi and King, the thing that really mobilized people on the beaches of India, the thing that mobilized people on the streets of Birmingham in 1963 to fight for civil rights, wasn't an inspirational leader or speaker. It was a friend or family member who's also marching for the cause. It didn't matter how persuasive Gandhi was. What really convinced ordinary people to hit the streets and march with Gandhi to the beaches of India was seeing someone they personally knew, say personally had a relationship with, fighting for that cause. And when they saw that, they realized, I can do the same. So every single person in this room has a unique story, a unique biography, a unique community. I don't have that power. No leader has that power. You have that power. And if we are going to get to the point where we're mobilizing thousands and tens of thousands of people to march, to fight, to protest, and yes, to rescue, we need you to see the power in yourself. We need you to be trained, educated, confident, and to believe in the vision of thousands of people bravely watching and marching into slaughterhouses and just taking the animals out. When you see your personal power, that is when our movement will see its power to change the entire world for animals. So I started this discussion. Thank you. I started this discussion with the story of a calf. A calf who escaped a slaughterhouse pen, but instead of being treated with kindness, she was screamed at, she was beaten with electric pods, and then she was shot over and over again. I want us to gather and envision a different sort of world and a different sort of story. Imagine that word gets out that a calf has escaped a slaughterhouse. But instead of the police arriving with shotguns, a massive crowd of vegans and activists marches right to that slaughterhouse. Instead of abusing this calf and scaring her with violent words, we offer her, for the first time in her life, a few gentle words of kindness. We gather around her and protect her from the slaughterhouse workers and the police who arrive. Instead of beating her with electric prods, we offer her food and water, the food and water she had been denied for possibly 20 plus hours on a transport truck. And instead of shooting her, we take her to sanctuary. Imagine this happening not just on one occasion in Omaha, Nebraska, 
But on every occasion, an animal gets out of a slaughterhouse. And imagine thousands of activists inspired by that immediate act of civil disobedience, converging on that same slaughterhouse and deciding we don't just want to save that one life. We want to save them all. And imagine and envision, instead of just hundreds of activists standing outside of the slaughterhouse, all of them marching nonviolently in, standing between the man who wants to kill the animals and the animal herself, and saying to them, Sir, we have no hatred in our hearts towards you. We have no hatred in our hearts towards any individual animal, human or non-human. But out of compassion and love and a commitment to justice and peace, enough is enough. It simply has to stop. Imagine us walking out with all 5,000 of those little calves who are going to be killed in that Omaha, Omaha, Nebraska slaughterhouse. And imagine the national and international story that will be provoked by such a powerful act of civil disobedience. Systems of injustice survive and thrive on ignorance and placidity. But they can be brought down. They can be transformed. They can be utterly utterly um, changed and remedied by action, by commitment and passion. So remember in your heart this vision, that within 10 years, I want to see this vegan fest change from not just 10,000 people or 20,000 people here to celebrate vegan culture, as wonderful as that is. We want to have 10,000 people prepared and trained and ready after a decade of meditations and educational offense and lectures and direct actions to walk right into that slaughterhouse in Tar Heel, North Carolina, and take all the animals out. And when we have that ability within 10 years, we will have the strength and momentum to transform the entire world. Thank you very much. Okay, so Wayne is going to take some questions, and I'll just help facilitate that. Raise your hand, and I'll come around. Just wanted to mention something close to home that people may not realize. The Biltmore Estate brings in millions of people, and they have descriptions of every aspect of the estate, how it was built, how the wood was carved, who painted the paintings, how the land was changed. There's one thing to which they offer no description of what you're looking at. And that's every spring they breed a lot of sheep who, who give off these beautiful babies. And everybody views this green grass and all these little baby lambs running around without any sign on the fence saying, what you're looking at are baby lambs that in three weeks we're gonna round up, slaughter, and serve in our restaurants and in other places in Biltmore, I mean in, in uh, Asheville. And my point is that that's very pointed. That's very pointed to, to like not wanting you to know that. They want you to look at these beautiful little white babies without telling you we're going to kill them. But they'll tell you every single aspect of everything else, but not that. And the second thing I wanted to quickly ask about is Austria a number of decades ago passed the most far-reaching animal rights laws, which gives you a feeling that it can be done. Can't, you can't trim your dog's ears, cut your dog's tail off, and that's the nation of Austria. And they have other, other things about circuses and chickens. Thank you for that feedback. And I think your comment illustrates two really crucial points, and I'm, I'm grateful to you for raising them. The first is how transparency has been distorted and confused and obfuscated to the point that in the society we live in today, most people believe that when they see a label that says cage-free, gas-fed, humane, it actually means something. And there have been a lot of really great consumer advocates, Ralph Nader being a notable example of this, who have fought for transparency and integrity, frankly, not just in our food system, but just in our economy in general over the past few decades. So consumers have grown to trust that labels actually mean something. But again, when the rules of the system are rigged and are so corrupt and are so engineered to serve the profit of corporations and stop activists from creating change in the world. You can't trust even the labels that you see on these products. 
And so one of our big objectives at DXC has been to inject some transparency into the system and show people what a cage-free farm actually looks like, what a humane pig farm or humane slaughterhouse actually feels like to the animals. And what we find over and over again is that because the animals of this earth are treated as if they're just things, because lawyers like me are completely powerless to stop even the most brutal actions against animals in the court of law, that these labels are utterly meaningless. So Dianne Feinstein, hardly a defender of the animals, she was the chief sponsor of the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act, is my senator in the state of California. And Dianne Feinstein went to the USDA and said, wow, there's been this huge profusion of animal welfare labels over the past 10 years, and I want to just like find out a little about them. And it turns out the USDA has to approve every single one of these labels. In fact, not only do they have to approve it, but they have exclusive authority over these labels. So if I, as an individual consumer, or even if I, as a city councilor in the city of Asheville or the city of Berkeley, wants to scrutinize the system and try and create some accountability in the system, I'm not allowed to do it. I can't sue a company for consumer fraud if they lie to me on an animal welfare label because the USDA says we have the exclusive authority over the system. We're the experts in this. You can't touch it. And so Diane Feinstein went to the USDA and said, well, you have the exclusive authority over this system. Let's see what you've done. How have you decided that it's appropriate for a label like free range or cage free or humane to go onto a product? And in 20 out of the 25 instances where an animal welfare label had been approved by the US government, by the US Department of Agriculture, in 20 out of those 25 cases, the USDA came back to Diane Feinstein with absolutely nothing. They did not have a single document, a single affidavit, a single photograph, or even a second of video footage demonstrating that the farmer was doing what they said they were doing. And the five cases where they did have a document, in all five of those cases, guess what they have? They had a single one paragraph affidavit where the farm company, and these aren't even farmers, these are big farm companies like Smithfield, which is now actually a Chinese conglomerate, in five of those cases where they actually did have a document, all they had was a one-paragraph statement sworn and signed by an officer of the company themselves saying, our products are free-range because we commit to selling free-range products. Literally, that was it. That's all it took. So when you have a system like this where even powerful U.S. senators cannot create transparency and accountability in the system, what do you do? And again, we have to stop waiting for politicians to change. Because even, frankly, the most progressive politicians. I was a big Bernie fan in the last election. Who was a Bernie fan? We love Bernie. I, I figure Asheville is a, a good place for Bernie. So there were, there were only a few senators who voted against the Farm Bill of 2013. And Bernie Sanders was not one of them. Because Bernie Sanders lives in a farm state. And frankly, even if he cared about animals, and I think he does, he doesn't have the political power within this system to defy an industry that has a stranglehold over the state of Vermont, which is dairy. So even Bernie Sanders voted to send $100 billion to animal agriculture and straight up subsidies, just handouts, and take $9 billion away from needy children. Right? This isn't even an animal rights issue. This is a human justice and poverty issue. This is what the last Farm Bill did. And even the most progressive politician in the country voted for the Farm Bill. We're investing in warfare against gentle, innocent baby animals and investing with money that is taken away from needy children because of the stranglehold these corporations have over our political system. The rules are rigged. And when the rules are rigged, we cannot work within the system. We have to disrupt the system. We have to disobey the rules. Not haphazardly, not with hatred in our hearts. We have to do it strategically with love in our hearts. But that is the only way we're going to create change and create transparency and integrity in our system. And I think when we do create transparency and integrity in our system, when we do give every human being on this planet an opportunity to see what it is actually like to be inside of a slaughterhouse, then the world will come around. So the second point you made, um, remind me what the second point you made was. The legislative change in Austria, right? Yes. And, yes. Um, so they, this is. They say that their chickens have to spend a, a large percentage of their life. Yeah. They put it under the sky. Yeah. So I think that is a beautiful, beautiful progression. And even the animal welfare laws that are profoundly limited and deficient are still important victories for this movement. But what I want to suggest is 
While we should be aiming for legislative victories like this, because frankly, whether it's the Indian independence movement, the women's suffrage movement, the civil rights movement, every single of these movements achieves success not just by changing culture, but by changing our political institutions, by passing laws, by amending the Constitution for animals. We should be proud and loud about the fact that we want an animal bill of rights to be part of the US Constitution. We want in one generation to go before the Supreme Court of the United States and the US Congress and demand an animal bill of rights that gives every animal on this planet, dog or cat, pig or rat, the right to be safe and happy and free because that is how rigged the system is. That is how much the system needs to change. Well, we have to rewrite the basic political DNA under which this, con this country was engineered and born. And activists who are working for legislative change need to be supported. But at the end of the day, if we work only in the halls of Congress without grassroots activists, frankly, making some trouble, righteous trouble, but trouble, on the streets, None of the politicians will have the power to act. Good-hearted politicians, decent politicians, politicians who see the power of direct action, see the importance of social justice, will support our movement over the long term. Just as that police officer, again, the political official, the law enforcement official who is designated to stop us from saving that hen supported us at the end of the day because we were willing to break the rules. So these two actions go hand in hand. The activists lobbying for change in the halls of Congress and the activists fighting and making change directly in the streets have to work hand in hand to create the long-term political victories we need for the animals. So one more question. Sorry for the long-winded answer. I'll make this really quick. Um, fortunately, unfortunately, I live very near a chicken slaughterhouse. So frequently on the side of a very busy road, there will be somehow, I don't know how they've gotten out of the crates, but live very ill chickens on the side of the road that I'll pick up and my vet will put to sleep humanely for me without charge. But he insists that they wouldn't survive otherwise because of the way they're bred, they can't stand. But now I'm wondering if that's even true. What happens to the chickens that you rescue? I mean, can they stand? Can they survive? Can they thrive? Thank you. So there are a lot of specific details of animal rescue that we go through in our rescue trainings. And I hope to someday do a rescue training in Asheville. Broiler chickens do have a bad life. And generally speaking, when a, when a chicken is down and about a third of them are down and immobile by the time they get to the slaughterhouse. So this is just at six weeks of age. So these are not just babies, they're infants. I mean, they're basically just out of the egg. By six weeks of age, around one third of chickens are immobile because they grow so fast and are so heavy, their legs literally collapse underneath them. So it's really hard to save a chicken who's down. But a, sick, a chicken who's just sick and languishing, a lot of times they don't stand, not because they don't have the power or because their legs are already broken, but because they're dehydrated. They're starving to death. Or frankly, sometimes they're just scared. They've been stuffed into a crate, literally just thrown in by the back of their legs, and have unable to even kind of spread their wings or stand up for days at a time. So the moment they get out, it often takes them a couple hours to figure out and get their bearings. It's just like, if you've ever been in a situation, frankly, even if you've just been sitting for a long period of time and you stand up, it's like kind of hard to stand back up. So a lot of these chickens you find, they're tough creatures. I mean, they've gone through hell and they still are alive. And so giving them a chance is always worth it. So when we rescue a chicken, we always do the best we absolutely can because we believe every chicken, every pig, every cow deserves just as much of a chance at life as a dog or cat. And if there's a dog who's fallen down, you don't just euthanize her on the spot. You try and give her some treatment. You get her to a vet who actually knows something about dogs and cats. And unfortunately, most vets don't know much about chickens. And so I'd encourage you to always give an animal a chance. And in my history as a rescue activist, I've probably been involved in rescues involving at least 5,000 animals now over the past 10 years. I've only euthanized an animal two times, right? two times. One was fairly recently. And that's partly because we get engaged in triage. We tend, when we're in a factory farm scenario, if there's an animal we think is so decimated there's no chance at her surviving, we don't even take her out. But we've only had to actually give that medication to two animals over 10 years and probably 5,000 animals. So I encourage you all to do the same. So I think we're wrapping up. So last thing, I just want to conclude with one thing which is trainings are important. Getting the direct personal experience on the front lines at a vigil or at a direct action at a slaughterhouse or farm is important. But the next best thing you can do is to simulate it in virtual reality. And we have some groundbreaking technology here today at the Vegan Fest that has not been shown anywhere else other than the Bay Area and the heart of Silicon Valley today at our booth. And so I'm gonna encourage all of you, if you wanna know what it's like to be inside one of these hell holes and not only be in there, but do something to help an animal 
to be embedded in a rescue mission with a team of veteran activists and taking an animal out, please go to the Direct Action Everett booth and, sim and go and have that virtual reality experience. Because when you have that experience and can say, I know exactly what it's like to be in the farm. I was telling you about your personal power and changing the people around you. Well, the thing that's always most powerful in changing the people around you is your own personal experiences. Because if you say, like, I saw a slaughterhouse video, or there's something on the PETA website, people are going to dismiss that. They're going to say, well, that's just propaganda. If you say, I have been outside of that slaughterhouse at Tar Heel, or I have been with a rescue team inside of a farm, and we took those animals out because we saw them literally rotting to death, that will be powerful to every single person around you. And while we cannot today, we don't have the training, preparation, or resources to take all of you to Tar Heel right now to start taking those pigs out, what we can do is the next best thing, which is give you a virtual reality simulation. So this is valuable not only because it will improve your credibility as an activist, but because it will give you a sense of what it's to, like to be on a rescue mission, what you have to deal with, what you have to confront, the challenges personally you have to overcome in dealing with that suffering face to face. And if you can overcome that, then you'll be ready to overcome it with us in person on a rescue mission at Tar Heel, North Carolina within 10 years. So please, go see that VR experience. It's transformative. And also hang out with us after the Vegan Fest, because I think a bunch of us who are interested in building community in the local area are been gathering and talking about the movement we're trying to build, not just in Asheville, but around the country for animals. And you can find out more about that at the Direct Action Road booth. All right, thank you, everyone, very much. Appreciate your time and attention.